I see this name, this firm pop up. Have they knocked on your door? He said, yep. I said, what's the issue with them and them, you know, I'm seeing wills being done by them in the black community. He said, they, yeah, they come in, they offer us money. And they offer money to get access to their clientele. So that's what they're done. That's what they've done. And so for black church or the funeral home is saying, hey, you might want to go to this firm to get your estate plan done. That's what they do. Right. And so, yeah, so I've seen it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't have any direct proof of it, but other than just somebody's mouth saying, yeah, they've come in here and and this is what they have done. And so, I mean, I don't know if it's still being done, but I know I've seen enough of them and I've redone enough wheels from prior situations where to know that there, there, there had to be some concerted effort because I've seen too many come across my desk. So which tells me, you know, they're not going to worship or they, look, uh, their, their relatives not getting buried at uh, Alexander Funeral Home in Charlotte. You know, <laughs> yeah. somebody was sad enough to go knock on the door and say, hey, uh, unfortunately, uh, in any profession, there's always unscrupulous activity that goes on. Hey guys, welcome to the Soul of a Man podcast. It's your boy DB. I am here tonight with my podcast partner, partner Mike, aka Chill. What's good, brother? They got it, man. They got it. Hanging in there. Hanging in there. That's all we can do. Well, look, ladies and gents, we're going to jump right into this because we got a brother on tonight. Uh, He is a returning guest. He's a uh, friend of the show. More importantly, he's a friend and brother of ours. Yeah. Uh, we, we've known this gentleman for quite some time now. Um, he was just on our episode, one of our episodes back in June, our Father's Day edition. Yeah. Uh, the three of us have something in wow. common as it relates to being fathers, as it relates to our fathers being educators, uh, and, and our late fathers being educators. Uh, so there's a lot in common that we have. Uh, yeah. We have tonight, ladies and gentlemen, our brother Eric Montgomery. He, he's a North Carolina Central Eagle. We, we won't hold that against him. We give him a hard time every time we see him, and he, he returns the favor. The love uh, is real. He's, he's Chills 1911, 1911 brother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those different colors. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very different colors. Very different, Very different colors. colors. Yeah, so yeah. But you know what? We're all brothers nonetheless. Um, oh, my God. We, we have with us tonight uh, – I'm going to call him tonight attorney Eric Montgomery uh, <laughs> because we're here tonight to talk about some things uh, of legality. Um, as you all know, uh, the last episode we were on with Jabbar Jamison and we were talking about insurance, wealth building, uh, investment tools and things of that nature. And tonight we have brother Eric on and we're going to discuss how to protect those things Um by making sure that we as a community are getting our states in order. Uh, Cause one thing you can guarantee is that you're going to check out of this piece. Absolutely. And one or two things you're going to check out and leave your family in a better position, or you're going to check out and leave them in a worse position. So our, right. our goal and objective is to try to make sure as many of our listeners as possible can make sure our families are taken care of. Um, it's bad enough that they try to take stuff from us as it stands, but it's another thing when we try to give it to them. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have our affairs in order and brother, uh, Eric Montgomery is here to assist us with that tonight. Eric, sure. welcome back to the soul of a man podcast, brother. Glad to be here, man. Thanks to be, thanks to be back on, on the program. You all have done a tremendous job with this and it looks great and it's getting better and better every time. And it's hard to believe it's, it's been a year almost since I was here last time. I mean, God knows, time, time has, has flown by. It's amazing. So. I yeah, said, yeah, Jill is here. It's almost a bonus already. <laughs> already, it's back around. So, yeah, it's fun. it's fantastic. So, but yeah, this is a a subject that uh, is near and dear to me. Um, when I when I started my firm back in two thousand and nine, after leaving corporate America after about almost twenty years, um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure I focused on was this area of the law, uh, estate planning, uh, probate administration, things like that, because uh, obviously um, knew there was a great deficit, particularly in the colors of the communities of color in 
having the right vehicles in place to protect their assets. And I was fortunate to grow up in the house where my, my parents did so uh, in a number of different ways, both from you know having wills and things of that in nature, to having insurances and annuities and a variety of things. I mean, my, my mom is 87, 88 years old in September and um, the things they put in place, she's still being cared for, you know, through those vehicles. So um, I, I, I witnessed firsthand that the empower the power and importance of having those things in place and led me to do certain things in my family as well. So uh, it's critical. And the, the, the amazing part is people think it takes a lot to put things in place, but it really doesn't. And, and I was, you know, talking to, to Mike earlier about you know, just my experience in the Charlotte community and doing things in, in, that, in my, you know, the community I grew up in. The the bulk of the people who are there are in their seventies and eighties don't have the wheels. And you look at jokers like us, <laughs> you got to fight for. Them. Um, and it's just amazing that that generation got it. And I'm trying to figure out what happened in, in subsequent generations and why they haven't gotten it. And what what did they learn and from whom? Because really, I dare say, they were probably the first generation to really have access to wealth in terms of owning property, going to college, yeah. learning about different uh, vehicles and tools. So uh, it's pretty fascinating. I, I mean, I probably need to do a book about it and, and do a study because it's truly a, a divide between that generation and, and later years in terms of who, who's ready, who's prepared. So. Right. Yeah, right. You know, but it's, I'm glad to be here to talk about it. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm admittingly one of those of your boys that um you've got to pull along. Um, <laughs> I'm, at the, I'm at the point where I, I know I need to pull it together. Probably should have done it much earlier, but yeah. at basically 60, um, it's a piece of my financial plan and estate planning that I don't yet have in place. And I want to say yeah. that um, particularly for our guests who are watching to let them know you're not alone. Right. Uh, you, you know, you're not alone in it, but we've all got to get on top of this quickly. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, it's, it's awfully important and it's real simple and it doesn't take a lot. And it just, it, it does a, a world of good for your family once you're not here. I mean, it's, it is that every week I get a call about either a situation where um, they had a will, can't find the will, will is missing or didn't do a will. You got this house and you going to be managed. And I hate to say it, and it goes across all races, death creates strange bedfellows. People uh, fall out, stop being family, stop being friends, because if they believe there's some asset out there that they're entitled to, um, Things change, yeah. and mindsets change, yeah. and you know, people who you think were nice people stop being nice people because they know there's access to some funds they may have an opportunity to get, and that's it. it, it money changes people. That's all I can tell you. So. I, I tell people things that uh, I'm getting a bad echo here that that break up the black community, and that's weddings and funerals. We've had this conversation. Um, not sure why weddings do, I guess people are hating and jealous or whatever. Uh, but I certainly understand, well, I don't understand, but I kind of get it why, you know, people passing do, uh, because people feel like they're entitled to something, uh, just because grandma told you that you were going to get her grand piano, uh, but she left no will or whatever. So who knows who's getting what? And so now you have family members fighting over grandma's grand, uh, grand piano, um, I think the one thing that I find amazing, Eric, is that the number, and, and we'll get into some of the particulars, but they're just the number of celebrities, man, high wealth individuals, yeah. whether they're entertainers or athletes or whatever, who passed away without a, an estate, a will, or anything. Uh, classic example, Prince. Uh, right. Example, Aretha Franklin. Right. Let's talk about these people and Prince's worth. I don't know. I think his net worth was somewhere between 200 and $375 million and he had no estate. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there are reasons for that. Uh, certainly some people of certain religious backgrounds have beliefs about those kind of issues. That's one that comes into play. Number two, I think, unfortunately, for a lot of people who are wealthy like that, who um, um, they have the God complex, they don't think they're going to die. And so, um, 
unfortunately, that happens. I mean, I think people just don't think about their divine. They don't think that it's going to happen to them. Um, or they, or it's just always one of these things, just like everybody. We, we assume that because they have money that they make sound decisions, number one. We know that's not true. Uh, we assume that because they have money that someone's just going to stand around and behind them and just make sure all their things are put in place. And that's not true. Right. Um, right. You know, having lived with a professional athlete for several years and watched how he had to interact with his family um, and the amount of drain on his time and energy and his money, uh, you can imagine people like that in those positions are always being pulled on by somebody in their family. And so they probably just, you know, in many situations, just didn't get to it because they've already been doling out millions over the years to, to their family. So, you know, it could be a number of reasons. Uh, really, it really is it's bizarre to me to think that savvy business people like Sam Cooke or Aretha Franklin or Prince didn't have the right handlers or advisors or people in their camp to say, hey, you know, you might want to do this or have this in place. But the reality is those people also tend to be very, you know, for lack of a better term, bullheaded. And you can't, unless you're really close to them, uh, they've always had to deal with people trying to get in their pockets. And so, and, I, and so, you know, it's, it's a dual edged sword for them, I'm sure. I, I'm sure it is. And, you know, unfortunately, so many folks have gotten burned. If you can think about Kareem Abdul Jabbar, you know, he lost a ton of his money for bad investments and people stealing from him and bad, you know, bad advisors. And, you know, th- that story is, 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 you know, has been repeated a million times. So, you think, you know, they try to trust people and then things can happen to them. So as a consequence, it doesn't get done. Much like a regular person like you are, you know, there. So, I mean, you know, this didn't happen. Uh, and you, again, if it doesn't make sense to you and I, because y'all got, y'all got the money, y'all should have it in place. But again, you can only imagine what they've had to go through. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. Well, Eric, let me, let me back up. Hey, guys, hey, I just, hey, just, hey, just stopped. Hey, because I've got such a bad hey, echo now myself. Let, hey, let me try to figure this out. Okay. Um, let me just see. Is that any better? It sounds good to me. I'm, I'm I don't hear the echo. Hey, are you, you seem to be skipping. I don't hear the echo, though. What have you got, D? I'm, he- I'm hearing you echo. Yeah, I've got nothing. I've got nothing around me. The phones are gone. Um, so I don't know what is producing this right now. Check, 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 check. You're sounding fine now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me try it. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Yeah, you're sounding good. Okay. All right, about to... uh... I think we're still recording. Oh, is it? Yeah. 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 Uh, So let me back you up a second, Eric, and ask (laughs) what happens or what starts to happen legally when a person transitions, when a person dies. Um, kind of, can you walk us through kind of what what happens in those sure. cases? So um, typically when I get those phone calls, the first question that I always ask is, did your loved one have a will? And so either it's yes or it's no, or it's we got one, we can't find it. <laughs> those, those are those are the standard answers. Um, and and so having a will means that that person died in the legal term is called testate uh, under the law. So you have testate and intestate. Intestate means you died without a will. Testate means you died with a will. And so that puts you into the category or the concept called probate. And so probate is where you take a person's will to your local courthouse to have that will that will proved to be in existence and to be a valid will. And that's what that's what technically probate means. Probate means to validate a will. And, and once a will is validated or not, will dictate the process that happens going forward. And so if a will is deemed to be a valid will, it names an executor, which is the person who's deemed to be put in charge to carry out that person's wishes according to that will. And it should have a list of beneficiaries 
whether they're individuals or organizations that will be the recipients of those gifts that were given to that person, given by that person to those entities after death. Um, if a person dies intestate, that means there was no will. And then the laws according to intestacy will kick in, meaning that um, because no will has been put in place, no one has been put in charge, someone will have to file an application to serve as the administrator of that estate. And the law has certain guidelines that a person has to meet in order to serve as an administrator. And then um, according to the laws of intestacy, uh, it will dictate who will be the eligible heirs under the will, uh, under under the estate, since there is no will to the roadmap. So, you know, it, it goes from your, you know, your immediate family, your spouse, children, if they don't, if they're not living, it'll go to, you know, other extended family members. And so that, that happens as well. Um, one of the more complicated matters I've been working on for the last couple of years is an estate that's worth uh, several a million dollars and about 33 heirs. And well, a family died with a will, remarkable. Um, I've got my suspicion that there may have been a will, but um, no will. And so we've been managing uh, the distribution of assets for people who are second, third, fourth cousins. Well, so it's a uh, piece of wealth. It's pretty amazing. And it happens, unfortunately. Um, and then there's a scenario, which I've been through on a couple of occasions, where a person has what's called a holographic will. And a holographic will just means it's a handwritten will. North Carolina is a jurisdiction that recognizes a handwritten will. So if a person uh, is in their last stages of life and said, bring me a notepad and a pen, date it and sign it and write out what they want to give. Um, hopefully it's been witnessed by someone and they sign it. They can take that will to the courthouse and it can be proved to be a valid will. Uh, I've had that done a couple of times here in Mecklenburg County. So that's another way that you can have a will. But those that's that's what happens when someone passes the first the first search, the first uh, order of business is does that person have a will? And that will dictate kind of the next steps on how the process will be effectuated through the court process. So if there's not a will in place. Yeah multiple people could come forward trying to claim to be the executor? Yeah, absolutely. Not, not claim to be, can apply. Yeah. And the requirements are not significant. You just have to be over the age of 18. You can't have a criminal history and um, you you um, have to you know be competent, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not it's not an onerous burden. But you know, typically they look to, they look to have someone in place who has a familial relationship, but it could be very well someone who does not. You know, I've I've served as uh, an administrator of an estate before, um, and uh, it could be a close family friend. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a family member who could be served as the administrator as long as they file the application and the court reviews it. I mean, they can make that determination. So we hear about. Um, things getting tied up in probate for years. That's right. Uh, what is typically the reasoning behind that? I mean, I know every situation can differ, uh, but I'm assuming there's some continuity across most of those who are tied up for that long period of time. Uh, where things are tied up for that time frame, uh, when you think the person has an ironclad will. So, what are some of the reasons behind that? Well, well, a um. It all depends on the validity of the will. So number one, the will should be valid. If it's not valid, then that could be one of the reasons why it's not administered you know, quickly. Number two, it just could depend upon the complexity of the asset base. Uh, you know, if you if you got uh, assets that are earning income, um, you, you know, it all depends upon you know are, are, do you have a group of heirs who is trying to liquidate matters to to serve to put money in their pockets versus someone who wants to keep the assets in place for those assets to, to continue to make money. I mean, so what, what the public doesn't see is all those kind of things. I mean, so you think about just take, take Prince's estate. I mean, you know, part of the challenge of this estate is it said he has this vault with, you know, with a million records in it. So what do you do with that? You know, how, how do you, how do you properly catalog that and manage that? And what you would think to be a reasonable period of time with someone with this kind of, well, it's going to take time. It's just, this is no way around it. Number one, number two, 
it, it's going to take time because once it's in the court system, nothing goes fast. And I, you know, I try to explain it to a lot of my clients. They, you know, they, you know, if someone knows they got some money and they come into it, you can only imagine the anxiety that they have. Yeah. Um, but what they don't understand is a lot of times, you know, you file something with the court, the court may not act on it for months. So it's out of my hands. And so, um, that, that those are other factors. So, I mean, you know, it's not like they don't have other cases to work on. They're not going to leap for all princes file to the front just because it's Prince. Um, you know, so there's all kind of reason why things take time. And, 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 and if you got multiple parties with competing interests, you can only imagine, you know, I hate to say it about my own profession, but you got lawyers going to be filing all kind of, uh, you know, motions with the court to, to, to slow things down or do certain things and advance their client's interest. And so every time there's a motion, the, 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 the ball stops. They got to go set a motion for a hearing and they got to show up at a hearing and argue in front of a judge. Then the judge has got to rule on a hearing and the judge may take a month or two to get back to you. I mean, so there are a whole host of reasons why things take a long time. And so you talk about a wealthy individual like a prince or someone like that who has significant assets, it's not going to be a, a, a swift process. And there's no there's no pro there's no mandate from any legal standard that it has to be swift. I mean, obviously they put those cases on a certain timetable to get administered, but as you can imagine, things come up, you know, people get sick, court people get sick, lawyers get sick, stuff slows down. It, it can it can get slowed down for any any number of reasons. So so yeah, there's no there's no one magic formula to this process at all. Gotcha. So you mentioned your your constituents, your yeah. your, your peers in the legal legal space. Um, filing, you know, everybody's filing a motion because they're representing this person. Somebody else is representing another person. I want to talk about the attorneys in this space in, in as a in general. Uh, on the last episode, we were talking to Brother uh, Jabari Jamison. And we talked about how uh, insurance companies, in particular white agents, would go into black neighborhoods and sell black people burial insurance. So sure. they were capitalizing on black yeah. the mortality of black people, essentially. Sure. Yeah. Um, I suspect in the legal space that that same practice probably holds true. I'm I'm speculating and guessing where attorneys that aren't black will go find a predominantly black neighborhood and say, all right, let's look at grandma, let's look at grandpa, let's look at aunts, uncles or whatever. Uh, their mortality is going to be, I don't know, 75 years old <laughs> in terms of what the CDC says. Um, we need to get you in, in a will and all of that good stuff. And now they start to capitalize on these elderly people and these people of color because they can go into the neighborhood and, and, and speak the language. Am I making this up or is there any truth to this? No, and it's not that scientific. They go into the black churches and the black funeral homes. <laughs> so they're doing, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, so I've been, I, I have, you know, uh, from time to time, people come into my office, they already have a will or a trust or something like that. And, and I'll see the law firm that it's from. And then when I start seeing a pattern, I said, this is interesting. And so I got a friend who owns a funeral home. I said, well, I see this name, this firm pop up. Have they knocked on your door? He said, yep. I said, what's the issue with them and them, you know, I'm seeing wills being done by them in the black community. He said, they, yeah, they come in, they offer us money. And they offer money to get access to their clientele. So that's what they're done. That's what they've done. And so the black church or the funeral home is saying, hey, you might want to go to this firm to get your estate plan done. That's what they do. Right. And so, yeah. So I've seen it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't have any direct proof of it, but other than just somebody's mouth saying, yeah, they've come in here and, and this is what they have done. And so, I mean, I don't know if they're still being done, but I know I've seen enough of them and I've redone enough wheels from prior situations where to know that there, there, there had to be some concerted effort because I've seen too many come across my desk. So which tells me, you know, they're not going to worship. Or they, look, uh, their their relatives not getting buried at uh, Alexander Funeral Home in Charlotte. You know, <laughs> uh, they, yeah, they, somebody was savvy enough to go knock on the door and say, "Hey." Uh, unfortunately, uh, in any profession, there's always unscrupulous activity that goes on. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had cases brought from underneath me from in the past. I've, I had a personal injury case 
a couple of years ago. It was a beautiful case. It was going to make me a lot of money. And um, there were four people in the car wreck to get hurt. And one came to me. And well, I guess I started talking to two of them. And parents, the other one went to another firm, a majority firm, and they came in and said, we're going to hand you a check for 50 grand and send this letter to your lawyer and tell him he's not a good lawyer and tell him he, he's fired and y'all all come over here. And that's what they did. That's, that's, that's unethical, but it happened. So, yeah, you, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, it happens. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, so absolutely. Cool. Let's think about this. <laughs> they... They inundate our neighborhood. They inundate our neighborhoods with drugs, poor poor food choices, yeah, right? Things that are killing us off. That's right. Then they come in, sell us the burial insurance, yeah. and come in and also write the wills and the trust. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> vicious circle. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You better believe it. It happens. Yeah. We. I mean, I. I I, I, I contend with that every day, right? right. Every right. single day. My my, I hate to admit it. My my least, uh, my lowest number of clients look like me and you, black men. Wow. Which my is two also, best clients are white women and black women. Wow. Which is also interesting, Eric. You said something earlier, uh, which brings me back to this question: that the baby boomers, our parents. Um, and some of our listeners' parents and maybe even some of their grandparents um, had their stuff together for the most part. Absolutely. It is us Gen Xers and then millennials and Gen Zs. And I'm, Gen Zs, it may be too early for them to think about. I yeah. don't know if it ever is really too early, but still. Um, yeah. In particular, us Gen Xers, though, we don't have our stuff together. Um, yeah. What is it that you think and again, this is mere speculation, I'm assuming. Uh, what is it that you think is prohibiting prohibiting us from moving forward? Uh, I can't imagine that it's economics because we no. spend more money than anybody else in terms yeah. of our disposable income. So what what is it? I, I don't know. It's 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 um it is it's plaguing to me. Um I, I don't I don't have an answer for it. I, I don't. I don't know what the is, issue is. Um, the access to information is there. Um, you, know, you mentioned, you know, most of pa their parents probably have their stuff together. And and maybe they just didn't sit down with their kids and say, you want to put this in place? Because I can tell you, I don't recall my parents sitting down with me telling me to do it. You know, so they had their paperwork. They got it. I mean, I got a file. I can put my hands right now. Parents, wills, everything. And I mean, actually, you know, I end up redoing my mom's and stuff like that. But, you know, you know, and I'm sure in large part because, you know, our neighbor, uh, you know, prominent black lawyer in the community, you know, he was, you know, two doors down. So he did their wheels um, as he did most other folk in the neighborhood. Um, but I, I can't explain it. I, I really don't know what to make of it. Um, and, and that's why, I, again, I, I chose to make sure as part of my practice, I focused on it. But back in 2013, 14, um, I did this uh, <laughs> gratuitous pro bono service project. I went to about 20 churches and did free wills. Wow. Uh, and I probably gave away a half a million dollars on legal services. Mm -hmm. And sad to say, I got nothing in return from it. I got no repeat customers. <laughs> I went to black churches, gave away free wheels, and nobody called me afterwards to do a traffic ticket or nothing. I mean, but that's fine. I did it for that. I did it. I chose to do it. With, with no expectation uh, of return, but the bottom line is, you know, I spent, you know, you know, 20 Saturdays on the church and spent three, four hours a day, those days doing those wills and um, hopefully change lives. Right. And so, um, but that's something I wanted to do. So I did it. And, um, and so, you know, the bar, the local bar here has a will clinic. They do something similar to that from time to time. And, you know, there's some outreach programs. I think that someone has created a national will day to kind of get educate people on wills, that sort of thing. But certainly it's not enough education. It needs to happen. Um, you know, and one of the things, you know, I've given thought to is how do, how do we, you know, reach kids who are coming out of college and even to, to put some things in place while they're in college because, um, you know, we, we make a lot of assumptions about access to our kids. And one of the things, you know, I've been um, educating clients on, if you have college students, I said, one thing you want to make sure once they reach age of 18, 
is to put a power attorney in place and have them make you their power attorney. Because yeah. say for instance, you got kids living on the camp, uh, in a, an off campus living arrangement. And if the lease is not in your name, because in your kid's name, something happens, you may not be given access to that premises unless you have power of attorney. Mm-hmm. Or you may not have access to other you know, financial assets. If, if you're not on the bank account with your kids, they have their own bank accounts, something happens to your kid, you know, you don't have access. And so you can't get access if they're in a coma or dead. So, you know, things putting things in place where your kids are, you know, become of age, you know, is, is something that I think all people should consider because things happen. College kids have situations, they have issues. So um, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a niche, I think, that we need to explore because uh, unfortunately, you know, things do occur on college campuses around and <laughs> you may not be granted the access you think you should because you're the parent. So, wow. Yeah. Can you tell us, um, explain the difference between um, will versus trust? Sure. These are, these are um, you know, two terms that people have probably heard but may not be able to distinguish between the two. Sure. Uh, myself being one of them. So um, what I, the, the simplest way I try to explain to people uh, is, is, so we, we talked about the trust, and, and so the trust is a document. I mean, the will is a document that basically says, you know, I, John Smith, hereby make my company my executor, and I want to leave my uh, jewelry and watches to Darren Bryant. I want to leave my, you know, house to Eric Montgomery, and 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 that's essentially what a will does. It says I, who I am, where I live. Um, these persons will be in charge, and these persons will get these assets. A trust is a different document, and, and really you should have both. It's not it's not really an either or process. It's really in conjunction with, uh, because when I prepare trust, I also prepare what's called a pour over will, which is like a catch all will that, that, that helps to identify any asset that's gained after the trust is created. So mm-hmm. a trust, for lack of a better uh, term or analogy, is it's almost as if you're having a a corporation for your personal assets. Think of it as a per, as a corporation for your personal assets. And so um, a trust is a document that's private. It's not re- required to be filed in any jurisdiction or any secretary of state or any register of deeds. It's a private document. And in that document, a person can, can serve as both a grantor or a trustor which means that's the person who owns the property and the trustee and the trustee for lack of a better term is the executor. The trustee is a person who will manage the trust. You can have individuals who can be the trustees, financial company service trustees, bank service trustees. So anyone who you deem you want to be in that position can be a trustee and you can put any asset you want to into a trust. You can, uh, I just did a trust today and the family owned about six properties and I deeded each of those properties out of the parent's name into the name of the trust. So now the trust, once I file these deeds with the register of deeds and they are accepted or recorded, that they will, that their legal ownership will change from the parent's names to the name of the trust. So the trust will become the owner of those, those, those entities. Mm-hmm. And so you, you can put anything, you can, you can retitle your bank accounts, the name of the trust, you can make life insurance beneficiaries in the name of the trust, uh, real property. Um, you can put your car in the name of the trust. Anything you want to put into a trust, is you can put it into a trust. And so what it effectively does, it takes it out of your hands personally. It removes any personal liability that you would have. Also, the other big asset that you get from having a trust is that it takes you out of the probate space because if you pass away and all your assets are sitting in the trust, the court is going to say, well, there's nothing for us to do because all your assets are owned by the trust. The trust is, the, is a, still a living entity. It's not been set aside. It's not been, you know, devised or broken up. So if all your assets are owned by the trust, there's nothing to be probated in the court. Well, this has been a tool that's been used by, you know, predominantly wealthy people, but anybody can use it. Mm-hmm. Um, to to manage their assets, to remove themselves from personal liability. Imagine, if, you know, you, you got uh, an event on your property and somebody gets hurt and they want to sue and you say, fine, sue me. 
but I don't own anything. Why not? Everything I own is in the name of the trust. So now you got to figure out how you're going to sue this trust that you never met, that you never had business with. Um, so, you know, that's that's the primary reason why you do it. And then, you know, you, you'll hear also these terms uh, revocable and irrevocable. Mm-hmm. And, and so just quickly, um, and unfortunately, you know, that that's one of these issues that kind of gets popped up in our community and a lot of these um multi-level markets and business opportunity type things and they're educated people put all your stuff in an irrevocable trust and you you can be free from lawsuits and all you know and you hear all this kind of crap but what they don't tell people and don't educate people is this so an irrevocable trust means just what the word means irrevocable means you put you somewhere and you are giving up complete control over it yeah and so you may not want to give your house into a irrevocable trust and give it completely away because you may you may need to use that vehicle for something down the road. Mm-hmm. And um, if you put it into a, a trust like that and, and, and you start doing changes and making edits and all kinds of different things and let's say a creditor comes after you, they may, they may take you to court and challenge the validity of the trust status and say, well, they put it in an irrevocable trust, but you know, they've they've taken five loans against it. And they've done X, Y, Z, and done X, Y, Z, and and really ha- it's not treated as the way it should have been intended to be treated. So you can you know, invalidate that 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 trust status. But so that's what that means. And so you typically see an irrevocable trust used by ultra wealthy individuals who are trying to minimize their tax obligation. That's what it boils down to. So if you think you're going to have an estate tax gift problem, which means you have assets in excess of ten million dollars. And you you want to put it in, in a state where it takes that tax asset off of your basis and puts it onto the basis of the trust. Prime example, um, I, I read this years ago. Uh, it might be 15 years ago um, when I used to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. There was an article talking about the fact that the Kennedy family had just. You know, 55 percent of Americans don't have a will. Protect your family today by addressing this important need. Call the Montgomery Law Firm. Hey guys, this is DB with the Silver Man Podcast. Hey, we really appreciate you guys rocking with us all these months. The feedback has been amazing. We hope to bring you uh, continue to bring you amazing content. We need a huge, huge favor from you though. We need you to like. I think that like button is somewhere right here. We need you to share. I think it's right here, maybe. And we need you to subscribe. Come on, guys. Keep rocking with us and, and share this content. And uh, we want to reach millions. We appreciate you. Papa Joe Kennedy in, in the early 20s purchased a building in Chicago. It was the Chicago Mercantile Building. It was the building that housed their version of the Chicago Stock Exchange and other financial uh, entities. He paid $2 million bucks for it in 1925, something like that. Well, they sold that property in about 15 years ago for $600 million. And that money didn't belong to Papa Joe. The money was part of the Kennedy family trust. That's why no one with the name Kennedy will never work because they put, they set up trust and the trust held all of their assets. So as long as a Kennedy and a Rockefeller and people like that live because their you know, ancestors were, were wise enough to know to put it into a trust, it's, you know, it's going to continue to fund that trust and be reinvested in all kinds of assets. So I'll never have to work. And so that's what you do, you know, you, but it was done. So again, because that way it, it minimized liability issues and it also maximized the returns for the family and took it out of his name and put it into a vehicle that could be managed by, you know, financial advisors to help continue to grow that asset base. Um, but at the same time, take care of his family. And that's what, you know, if you want to do it the right way and do it in a way that benefits your family in perpetuity, you put it in a trust and that way, let your trust own it and have the right people managing it and being responsible for making sure that trust continues to operate in a way that creates wealth for your family. And that's, that's what you want to do. So, and also it becomes a bank. Mm-hmm. You, can, <laughs> you got to ask it. Leave me alone. Go to, go to the trust. That's a very horny did. You know, his parents set up a corporation. It, you know, it was a corporation, it was a trust, but his dad set up a corporation. Aunts and uncles put money to the to the business. When he first started Motown, he went and got a loan from the family corporation. I mean, who did who does that? But his family was savvy enough to have a corporation back then that he got a loan from that he had to pay back when he started Motown. It, it could have been a trust, it could have been a company. I mean, yeah, but same concept. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> so you tell me why did they know that in 19 
you know, 30 something, 40 something, very gory, went to his dad's corporation and got a loan. I mean, what black folk were doing that back then? Or even now, for that matter. Who's doing that now? Right. You know? Right. Remarkable story. Yeah. So, Eric, if, if, a, if you have a trust and let's say you have property within that trust, and I know these are hypotheticals and I don't get too deep into this, but you you decided to sell off. Let's say you have a house you know, and it's in the trust and you decide to sell that house. Does the house does the trust pay capital gains or can do you still as an individual pay capital gains on that property? I can't answer that now. I'm not a, I'm not a financial expert. But again, my guess would be whoever owns the property. Again, if you if you have deeded it into the trust, it belongs to the trust. You it doesn't come to you. That's why people do it because it removes you from the equation. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, you know, it the trust it will be will pay the taxes. The trust will manage the asset. So the trust is the owner of the. Again, you're you're transferring it from yourself to the trust. Okay. So I think the easy answer is it's the trust, not you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. When you, when you start to work with work with clients and i'm not talking about the 10 million dollar clients i'm talking about your your, your everyday folks yeah. um and, and i'm sure that there's ob- obviously an educational component to it just to get people to understand um the the yeah. various aspects of it what do folks need to bring to you they're coming to you for the first sit down with you what sort of documentation what sort of preliminary work did they need to have done to i guess potentially pull their assets together um a list of assets together uh and and what other sorts of things would they need to come to you with so i, I have a questionnaire that, that that helps that with that process so once we set up a meeting i'll send that ahead of time and ask them to fill that out and that way it'll, it'll tell me kind of what's at stake what's at play and, yeah. and then we meet uh, and talk through that and go through that to figure out kind of what their goals are. Yeah. To follow up to that, and, and again, I'm talking about the everyday man. Yeah. Do you, do you find that once uh, clients go through your questionnaire, a light bulb goes off that they may have more assets than what they originally thought? Well, not necessarily. You know, it's just, um, no, it's just, you know, they have what they have. I mean, some people say, well, I didn't, it didn't take too long. I didn't have too much. I said, That's okay. It doesn't matter. We're not here to judge you based on what you got or what you don't. We want to manage what you have, and we just kind of go from there. But certainly, you know, part of what I try to do is, again, make them aware of different things. You know, I'm a big proponent of insurance. So I'm always, you know, letting people know, you know, you might want to do this, and you can use insurance to that process. Um, and, you know, my parents use it effectively and still have used it. You know, my mom has, again, benefited from things my parents had years ago. And so she gets an annuity check every month. And, you know, so the house is paid for, she gets money on top of her Social Security money, and, you know, she'll, she's going to be fine. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I've got to make sure we're in the same position. But, yeah, that's that's that's, that's what it's all about. And uh, But, no, it's just all about, you know, making sure that, you know, I help them understand what, they have and how they can manage it and if they want to do other things to make sure I connect them with other people in my network uh, to help them accomplish those goals. Do you think, do you think, Eric, because you just said something about, you know, people say, hey, well, I don't have a lot. Do you think that's one of the biggest misconceptions in in our community because you don't have a lot, you shouldn't do a will or or whatever? Absolutely. I hear all the time. Hear it all the time, and and I tell them I said, look, you know, one of the things that I always do in, in my documents is I I write it in a way that says, if I should ever come into X Y Z, that I wanted to come to this person. You know, a lot of times I could come to people, they may not own a home, but they may help, they may own one one day, and so you still want to have some provisions in there that kind of addresses those issues. So I try to write them in a way that says, you know, if if I should acquire a home during the course of my lifetime of my death, I wanted to go to X Y Z stuff like that. So doesn't have to be, you know, it, again, the will language can be whatever you want it to be. It's, it's really your final wishes. Whatever you want to say in that document, you can say, as long as it's discernible and and and, and doable and, and you know, it's been properly executed and witnessed and that sort of thing. So it's, it's valid. It's whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Is, is affordability or the misconception of affordability of getting it done a deterrent for folks? It shouldn't be. A basic will cost, my fee is 300 bucks. A basic will. 
I mean, you know, you tack on some other things, but yeah, I mean, a basic, I charge three hundred dollars for a basic wheel. It's been out on Jordans. You can't tell me you can't buy a wheel. You can get a wheel. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's all about what you want. Which has been my gripe for the longest. We and, yeah. and I hate to keep saying we, but I don't care about it. Well, I shouldn't say I don't care, but I'm more concerned <laughs> about us. Right, right. Um yeah. we we have again talk about disposable income or even income that's really not disposable. We will find ways to spend it um right. on, on these great consumer consumer goods, but the things that gonna the things that are gonna take care of us and our family for years to come and create legacy, we choose or opt not to. Yeah. Um so for you for me to hear that it only costs three hundred dollars to do a simple will. Yeah. And look, and look, you can go online and print them. Some people do. They may mess them up. They didn't bring them to me. I said, why did you do that? Just, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's all kind of ways to skin that cat and do it, you know, you know very uh, low cost. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a no-brainer from a cost standpoint. It really is. Got it. So it's just a matter of, it's a mindset. That's all it is. It's just a mindset. Yeah. It's nothing else. It's just a mindset. And I, t- and I was talking to Chill earlier. Even if you don't even have a wheel, I said the most basic thing you can do is go to the bank with your loved one and make sure everybody's name is on a bank account, whether that's a joint account with right of survivorship or paid on death or something. Just make sure you have access to the money when somebody dies. That's the main thing you need to do. If you don't even have a wheel, run to the bank tomorrow because you got to go to the bank and do it in person and have everybody sign a signature card and make sure that account is designated that someone wants to have a right to those funds when the main person dies or one per- person dies. So that way you don't have to go to court and start a probate process to get letters of administration just to get into the bank account. So you definitely want to do that. Gotcha. And yeah, with your business assets. I mean, I got my wife on all my, my, my business accounts because if something happens to me tomorrow. That's where the money sits. You better go to the bank, to the business accounts. Cause that's, you know, that's where it's flowing in. So you gotta, you know, make sure your family has access to stuff. And that's, that's, that's what you gotta do. That's key. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's key. That's key. Eric mentioned that he and I talked um, a little bit earlier and was just expressing my own concerns as a single person with kids. Um, you know, young teenagers, 18 year old and 14 year old. Um, you know, I've, I've got to get some things in place specifically for them. Absolutely. And just hearing this conversation tonight to make sure and ensure that they have access to those accounts, which they currently do not. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Do not. Yeah. And you got the whole guardianship piece. And obviously, you know, you've got, you know, ex-spouse. But if you imagine if you didn't have an ex-spouse uh, and it's just you and a lot of people in that situation. So if something happens to you, who's going to care for your kids? And so that's something you got to think about. You don't you don't want them to be in a situation where their life is altered to such an extent that you know it makes them dysfunctional because there was no plan put in place to make sure they continue they can continue to function the way they need to function to be successful. So, right, and that happens yeah. um, because there was no plan for guardianship. Then the family's got to scramble. Who's going to take care of these kids? I ain't been raised for the last twenty years. <laughs> you know, I got to go learn these new pe- these new people over here and. Uh, and tell them what they can't do because I ain't your daddy. You know, I ain't your daddy. You know, <laughs> I don't love you like your daddy, so you can't do all these things. So, <laughs> I mean, of, that's real. You know, that's real. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of kids, e, you mentioned earlier on about if you have college age kids or kids over the age of eighteen, uh, having them having a power of attorney or you having a power of attorney over, yeah, over whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it solely if they're? I'm assuming the power of attorneys if they're incapacitated in some in some sort or no, or no. expired. No, no, sir. No. So first of all, power of attorney doesn't work once a person dies; it expires. So the power of attorney, um, its power is then extinguished once a person dies. So the power of attorney can be what's called springing, meaning that it only comes into play when a person becomes incapacitated. Or it can be what's called durable, which means the minute you sign and file it with the rest of deeds, you have that power immediately. So it, you have different variations of how you want to set it up. But I, I tell people, 
you know, just go ahead and do it for now because, A, it's going to be a person you trust, and B, you know, someone you trust, they're not going to take advantage of you, and C, you don't have to worry about getting into any wrangling as to when a person becomes incapacitated, you know, so... So, yeah, but yeah, no, it, you know, it's it's really just something, you know, I've run into because I had a situation where some clients had some issues with the kids in college and they didn't have access. Come to me, so what can we do? I said, I don't know because they're an adult. You know, and because they're an adult, you know, you know you're not, you can't necessarily say just because I'm paying the bills that you're supposed to have access. You can go raise all the eight you want, but if they're an adult, if they're living in a place where their name's on the lease and yours is not, a landlord technically does not have to give you uh, permission to go into that premises. So, right. And does that power of attorney also give you access to like medical records and? No, no. You have to have a healthcare power of attorney and a uh, HIPAA authorization to get access to medical records. So, yeah. Again, the same kind of things I do with my regular clients. You should consider having with your children who are in college. Well, I just say who are over the age of 18, who are not under your roof. You want to make sure that they are in position and you have access to their information at all times. So, yeah. Got it. And what about DNR, um, do not resuscitate orders? Is that through through someone like yourself or is that more yeah. health? Yeah, it that's, is. That's, that's, that's through the healthcare power attorney. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, all this, those are covering those documents. This is um, it's good information, man. Um, you know, we we've got folks who are listening. Again, some who would have these things in place, some others who don't. Um, oh, yeah. We're gonna give you um, really kind of the final word here in regards to why folks need to do it um, as as they're moving into this second half. Uh, as we've talked to you about, we concluded that with a especially with black men with an estimated life expectancy of 73 um yeah. take, take, take out those other <laughs> those other sources that that um shorten our lifespan um yeah. black men in this country but um uh want to give you an opportunity to to let folks know why um final word here why it is critical to do this it's all about love so I can tell you, if you love your family, you want to make sure that beyond your grave, you've done things to make their life easier. It's just that simple. There's nothing else to say about it. It's just if you love your family, if you truly love your family, you're going to put your stuff in place to make sure your those people who you say you love dearly, unquestionably, that their lives will not be put into turmoil because you pass away. It's just that simple. Whether that's through life insurance, will, trust, whatever vehicles you want to put in place, you, the whole goal should be to help them live better than you lived and they make their life a little bit easier. And that's, at the end of the day, that's what it's about, you know, and hopefully, you know, we can continue to preach this message throughout our community and get people on board to say, let me take care of my family because I love them. And that's just as simple as it is. Love is the simplest answer to, to all our issues. That's all it is. Wow. Yeah. So Jeez. look, and, and, and we normally let the guests have the final word, but I gotta, I gotta get this in, and I gotta <laughs> piggyback off of what you said, Eric. Um, for those who will be watching this episode, I, I know a lot of our community they probably have their affairs in order, but we all have a friend, we all have a relative who does not. Uh, I ask you, and I implore you to please share this episode. Please ask them to watch, uh, not for our sake but for the sake of your their your your families or your friends uh sake um i don't know that we've probably done a more important episode than this one um so again i implore you to please 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 share this with people that you know people in your community people in your family uh because the information that eric gave us tonight will save us a whole lot of headaches and a whole lot of family drama down the road that's my two cents that's my soapbox (laughs) Great. Well, again, man, I appreciate you guys having me on board. Uh, I, I've been able to present at a number of different venues about this topic and will continue to do so and blessed to do so. And whatever I can do to help make your, your platform as good as it can be, I want to be a part of doing that. So thanks again for having me here. I appreciate
appreciate you. Appreciate thank you, brother. Thank you. And right. uh, we thank our guests for checking in with us. And as always, from our souls to yours, we thank you for your continued support. 